Well, good evening and welcome to our study in Ecclesiastes. We're so happy that you've made it out and connected and are going to open your Bibles and, and study the Word of God with us again this evening. It is a pleasure to see those of you that are connected. We know that more will connect here a bit later and others uh, will watch this on a recorded uh, version and later on tonight because of work and other obligations that they have. But nonetheless, thank you for, for being uh, together tonight. We're going to look at Ecclesiastes 7, uh, a, a chapter that I've titled Solomon's Prodigal Journey, and hopefully we'll see why uh, the uh, title is, is such as it is, Solomon's Prodigal Journey, uh, where he was lost and uh, was found. Uh, but but we'll, we'll see that here shortly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, businesses have taglines, uh, things that make us, uh, when we hear it, make us think of that business. For example, years ago, I believe in the 80s, uh, one of the taglines was, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. And that should make us think uh, almost immediately of that financial company called E.F. Hutton. Uh, how about the one that said, eat more chicken? Uh, the way more and chicken are spelled makes us think of Chick-fil-A because Chick-fil-A has introduced us to the idea that cows can't spell. Nothing, wrong, nothing runs like a deer. Uh, and that should conjure up an image of a John Deere tractor, a green John Deere tractor. When you care enough to send the very best, you pick up a Hallmark card. How about this one, don't leave home without it. And that's American Express. <clears throat> In the 80s, there was a commercial by um, Wendy's that had these ladies uh, opening up a hamburger bun and asking the question, where's the beef? The, these are, are business taglines, again, that, that are, are very familiar with the businesses, that's very familiar with slogan merchandising, uh, with advertising. Well, Solomon has his own taglines in the seventh chapter. We are going to pull out a few of those taglines, uh, things that should, when we hear them, when we read them, we should immediately think of a man that was given all the wisdom or given a, a divine measure of wisdom, was given a lot of money uh, by the hand of God, and that he, later on in his life, comes up with these taglines. For example, a good name or a reputation is better than expensive perfume. It is better to go to the house of mourning than a comedy club. Uh, it is better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than to listen to the jokes or the laughter of fools. Solomon is also famous for saying, patience of spirit is better than haughtiness of uh, a spirit or pride of spirit. Um, why, why are these taglines so important now in the seventh chapter? Why didn't Solomon uh, talk about, about these things in the fourth or third or, or even second chapter? Why did he open the book in chapter one with a good name is better than expensive perfume? Why didn't he say something uh, about uh, it's better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than the laughter of fools? Well, it's because we, we've come to the, to the mid-half of the book, uh, and, and it's Solomon finally coming to his senses because in the first six chapters, what's described is, is a playboy attitude. What, what, what we read is a young man that was giving a lot, a young man that was giving a lot of wisdom, was giving a lot of popularity, was giving a lot of money. He received everything, didn't work for a thing. And, and he used all of those things not for the benefit of his soul and not for the benefit of his people, but for the benefit of his ego, the benefit of his, of his pride, of his, of his uh, uh, playboy status. Because every single time that he was presented with a problem in chapters one through six, where did he look for those answers? He looked for those answers under the, the sun. But now in the seventh chapter, it's like the prodigal son who spent a good part of his time away from home desiring to eat the slop that was coming out of the mouths of pigs. 
who spent the first part of, the, of his time away from home uh, partying, getting drunk, womanizing, having a woman on each, on each arm and, and drinking and getting drunk. Uh, according to his oldest brother, this is what he did. And, and while he had money, while he had all, that, uh, all, all those material things, he was having a good time, but wasn't, wasn't caring about how he hurt his father, didn't care about his own soul, didn't, didn't care about wisdom. There was no advice that his dad had ever said to him that, that was playing any role in this boy's life when he first left home. And Solomon had the same problem, that uh, during a certain part, a certain period of Solomon's life, he took God's wisdom, he took God's money, and, and he spent it on himself. It was to pleasure himself. That's why in the first chapter, he talks about bringing women dancers and male dancers and entertainers and, and, and jesters and uh, food galore and animals from all over the, uh, the world and plants that were uh, to make his botanical gardens the envy of the world. And that's why after those things didn't bring him uh, happiness, he then decided to build buildings, get into architecture and engineering lakes and rivers. And the man was a mess. And by the time we get to the seventh chapter, it's the later part of his life when he says, I've been there and I've done that. I, I, have, I have given into the pleasures of man. I've, I've done everything that money can buy, everything that, I'm, that my eyes saw and desired. I didn't withhold it from him. So he says, but now when we get to the seventh chapter, he's like the prodigal son that's been watching the pigs eat and desiring that food that falls from the mouse. And he finally says, what am I doing here? In my father's house, there is a lot of food. It, it even goes to waste. And, and here I am, the king's son, desiring to eat pig slop. I know what I'll do. I'll recognize that I've sinned against my father and against heaven. I'll admit to those, I'll own up to that, I'll take responsibility, and I'll go home with the tail tucked between my legs, and I'll beg my father's forgiveness, and I'll ask him to, to take me in if he has mercy. And this is Solomon's prodigal son or prodigal coming home moment, where he finally says money, physical things, women, men, liquor, all those things are for naught, that it's, it's useless. If God is not my goal, if my eyes aren't on heaven, then everything that I have, all these material things, it, it does not bring happiness. There's this, this um, quote from our book that says, wisdom is the ability to see life with that objectivity and handle it with rare stability. In other words, wisdom is that ability for us to see beyond our noses, to see beyond our wants and our desires. Wisdom is the ability to, to take advice, whether we like it or not, to hear criticism, whether it, it, it hurts our ego or not. It, it, wisdom is the ability to be able to sift out whatever people are saying about us. Wisdom is the ability to have thick skin and not be easily offended. Wisdom is the ability to, to know when to remove yourself from a situation. Wisdom is the ability to see death and think about your own mortality. Wisdom is the ability to, to see God and desire to be God-like, to be more righteous, to, to walk in the footsteps in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. That's what wisdom is. So we're going to read from this, from this uh, uh, very general paraphrased uh, translation of this chapter. I'm not, I usually use New American Standard, but, but for this chapter, uh, I think that the New Living Translation just makes it more, um, more simple, a lot easier to understand. It makes it more down to earth. So it begins by saying in chapter 7, verse 1, a good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. The day that you die is better than the day that you were born. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone is going to die. So the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. A wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool thinks only about having a good time. 
better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. A fool's laughter is quickly gone, like thorns crackling in a fire. This also is useless. Extortion turns wise people into fools and bribes corrupt the heart. Finishing is better than starting and patience is better than pride. Control your temper for anger labels you a fool. Don't long for the good old days. This is not wise. Wisdom is even better when you have money. Both are a benefit as you go through life. Wisdom and money can get you almost anything, but only wisdom can save your life. Accept the way God does things, for who can straighten what he has made crooked? Enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that God is in charge of both the good times and the bad times, and remember that nothing is certain in this life. I have seen everything in this meaningless life, including the death of, a good, young, uh, of good young people and the long life of wicked people. So don't be too good or too wise. In other words, don't be too good for your own, or rather don't be too wise for your own good. Don't be uh, too big for your britches. Why destroy yourself? On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Pay attention to these instructions for anyone who fears God will avoid both extremes. One wise person is stronger than 10 leading citizens of a town. Not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Don't eavesdrop on others. You may hear your servant curse you, for you know how often you yourself have cursed others. I have always tried my best to let wisdom guide my thoughts and actions. And I said to myself, I am determined to be wise, but it just didn't pan out. Wisdom is always distant and difficult to find. I searched everywhere, determined to find wisdom and to understand the reason for things. I was determined to prove to myself that wickedness is stupid and that foolishness is madness. I discovered that a seductive woman is a trap more bitter than death. Her passion is a snare and her soft hands are chains. Those who are pleasing to God will escape her, but sinners will be caught in her snare. This is my conclusion, says the teacher. I have discovered this after looking at the matter from every possible anger. Though I have searched repeatedly, I have not found what I was looking for. Only one out of a thousand men is virtuous, but not one woman. But I did find this. God created people to be virtuous, but they have each turned to follow their own downward path. Now, I know that this translation takes a lot of liberties. I, I, I understand that. Uh, but, but again, I, I think that you will agree that it is at least more down to earth and, and uses a language that's a lot easier to understand. Um, so, so let's look at some of the things that Solomon is saying from some of his taglines, right? Uh, he, he takes this, in the seventh chapter, he changes his writing style. Chapters one through six were very poetic in style. Chapter seven through the end of the book, are more proverb style. You know, just like Proverbs gives us a, a this is better than that or, or listen to the counsel of the wise and not. So Solomon takes on that same flavor, that same style in the seventh chapter. And what he's telling us here in the seventh chapter, that last verse of the seventh chapter means this. I've lived a life where I have given in to myself I lived a life where I've lived in excess, where I've gotten drunk and tried to find the answer in wine and liquor. I, I've, I've lived a life where I've given myself over to, to the pleasures of women, trying to find happiness. And the only source of true happiness is in God. And that's what that last verse is actually teaching us. So, so everything that he says from, from chapter 7 through the end of the book it's from his own experience, right? And I think that experience is a best teacher. Uh, our, our children, we can send them to the best colleges. We can, we can even send them to the worst colleges. It doesn't really matter. You can send them to the best colleges with the best professors. The only best education than a Harvard education is a school of hard knocks. And this is what Solomon is teaching us here in the seventh chapter. 
Uh, I've been there and I've done that. So, so everything I'm telling you, says Solomon, it's because I've lived it. No one told me this. I've lived it. I've, I've banged my head against that wall so many times until I finally said, look, it's just best to accept God and to look at him as a source of happiness and not everything else. So the first thing that he tells us is that a name or a reputation is better than expensive perfume. Well, what good is expensive clothes, a fancy mansion, and, and the latest model of a vehicle if everyone in town thinks you're a jerk? What good is it to be the, the most, um, the wealthiest person in your community, but people see you as an Ebenezer Scrooge? And, and this is exactly what, what Solomon is teaching us. Look, don't, don't go out there to, to look uh, for ways to um, uh, fancy yourself up and to step on top of people to get to the top. But why not rather make yourself for yourself a good name by being kind, uh, by showing mercy, uh, by loving your neighbor as yourself. You know, what, what a novel concept. He said, when you do those things, when you live that way, uh, people will respect you more. People will, will remember you more for the good things. And I, I think that everyone will agree that it takes a lifetime to build a reputation. But one mistake can destroy that reputation, that person's reputation. And look at Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 1. Uh, when I was a, a, a child and mother would let me go or drop us off at the swimming pool or at the grocery store, wherever, uh, anywhere that we would go, she would always say, act like somebody. And, and what she was trying to remind us is, uh, is to don't forget who you are, don't forget who, where you came from. And, and act like somebody that has sense. Act like somebody has manners. Make sure that you say thank you and please and excuse me. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Thank you. Make sure that, that you live like we've taught you. Act like somebody. And Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 10 verse 1, dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink. So a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. So what, what he's saying here is that, you know, a perfume... That's, that's costly, uh, that, that can cost, I don't know, $1,000 an ounce. One dead fly, one dead uh, fly in that ointment and that perfume will stink and will mess it up. Well, so is the same, or the same thing applies with, with wisdom and honor. People can know you for, for being wise and, and respect you and give you honor, but if you act like a fool, that little foolishness can destroy that reputation. So that's why he said it's better to have a good name than all these other material things. But in the same verse in Ecclesiastes 7, 1, but the second part, you recall Solomon there makes, makes this claim that it's better, uh, that death is better than the day that you were born. And, and that, sounds, uh, that sounds quite uh, fatalistic, doesn't it? It sounds a little depressing that the man would say, it's better that the day that I die would be better than the day that I was born. But there's a reason why Solomon is saying this. It isn't that he's fatalistic. It, it isn't that, that he's depressed and would rather commit suicide. That's not, suicide's not even in this equation. What Solomon is finally saying in his old age is this. Put your eyes on the things above. Make sure that your eye is on the prize, that you're looking at the crown that's reserved for you. Make sure that God is your focus. Because the day that we die, what's all your money going to do for you? What's that fancy mansion going to do for you? Solomon has already uh, uh, commiserated about that. He, he, said, he said in the previous chapters, you know what, one of, my, one of my troubles that doesn't allow me to sleep at night is wondering who's going to take over all of my things? Who's going to become the owner of my mansions, of my temples, of my palaces? Who's going to take my wives? Um, 
you know, it reminds me of, um, of King David. Re remember when one of his sons wanted to take the kingdom from him? He went and flattered people and, and got them to follow him. And he now had a reputation. He had a following. He had a fan club. Then he runs his daddy out of town. And, and then the, the David's son to, to show the world, to show the kingdom that he is at large and in charge. He takes all of his stepmothers, all of King David's wives, and on the rooftop rapes them in public only to later be killed because none of those things matter. When Solomon says, the day that you die is better than the day that you're born is, this, is for this reason. When you, or I guess in general terms, when, when, you, when you're born, you have about 70 to 80 years to live. There's gonna be 70 to 80 years full of trouble and strife and disease and sickness and sorrow and pain. He says, but the day that you die, you get to go to Jesus. I think that's the point that Solomon is making. That's why the day of your death is better than the day that you were born. You'll finally be released. You'll finally be, be released from this world and, and the curse uh, uh, that, that sin has brought upon this world, all that pain and anguish and suffering. Philippians 1 verse 21, Paul says, uh, for me, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Again, Paul wasn't... Uh, uh, encouraging someone to kill him, but he understood that everything in this world is just passing by. But what's not passing by is life with God in heaven. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit of the Lord, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. Now, isn't that a beautiful and amazing, comforting promise? Those who are dead are blessed. Why? So they can rest from their labors because of the way they lived on this earth, for their deeds follow with them. Hebrews 11, verse 4, By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testified about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. So this passage is illustrating that, that the way Abel lived, the way Abel conducted his life on, on, on this earth, allowed him to have that rest and that comfort, as the scripture says, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Well, Solomon goes on to give us another tagline, another proverb. Everyone um, uh, wants to go to heaven uh, is, is, is I, uh, you know, something quite common. Uh, I've never been to a funeral where the preacher said that that guy in that casket is a low down, good for nothing, uh, whatever. But every funeral I've been to, uh, that person in that casket is usually preached into heaven. Um, the thing is that nobody wants to die, but everybody wants to get to heaven. And the only way we can make it to heaven is if we're still alive when the Lord comes or if we die. And death is inevitable. And that's Solomon's advice. So his next tagline in verse 2, in the same vein of life and death, he says, you know, it's, it's, better, it's better to go to a funeral than to a comedy club. And again, sounds when you read it on the surface, it sounds like this man is so depressed. Like if he's so cynical. But what he's actually saying is this. When you go to a party, when you go to uh, uh, a comedy club, uh, a play, a symphony, whatever, you're usually not thinking about your own mortality. You're usually not thinking about, am I right with the Lord? You, you know, at a party, you're not thinking, if I was to die today, would I go to heaven? But at a funeral, who are, what are you thinking about? 
At a funeral, it's, it's a perfect opportunity for you to do some soul searching, to see your own mortality, to think about your own fate. Because funerals aren't for the living. I mean, aren't for the dead. Funerals are for the living. So then he goes on, Solomon, that is, goes on to, in verses 3 and 4 to talk about this sorrow being better than, than laughter. Sorrow better than laughter. Let, let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verses 3 and 4. He says, sorrow is better than laughter for sadness has a refining influence on us. A wise person thinks a lot about death while a fool only thinks about having a good time. And, and this goes back to, to uh, uh, going to the uh, funeral parlor uh, that he just spoke about. Uh, because this is, this is a time that, that you're gonna think about your own mortality. So when he says that sorrow is better than laughter, what he's saying is this, a wise person will make preparation for when calamity strikes. Um, there's a financial man out of Tennessee, Dave Ramsey. He, he, he was, he's always given this advice. Always have an emergency fund of money set aside. Uh, because we're all susceptible to Murphy's Law. And Murphy's Law is if anything can go wrong, it's going to go wrong. He says, always set an emergency fund of two to three months aside so that when something happens, an emergency happens, you'll have that money. If you get fired, you get laid off, uh, coronavirus. You, you're, so the wise is always making preparations for that day of destruction. But Solomon is making the point that the wise is always thinking about eternity about his soul. And where will that soul spend its eternity? In hell or in heaven? And when, again, when we spend our time partying, when we spend our time uh, uh, getting drunk, womanizing, we're not thinking about our own mortality. We're not thinking about our soul. And that's the point that he makes here. And, and this is coming, as you can see in this, on the slide, this is coming from the ultimate party boy. This is coming from the man that, that, that said, I, I brought female dancers and, and then I got bored with them and I brought male dancers and I got bored with them. I, 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 uh, I ended up marrying a thousand women and I got bored with them. He says, I, I, I've got drunk, I've done, I mean, I've done it all and I'm not happy. Or that didn't give me happiness. What brings me happy, happiness is something else. And that's being right with God. That is having your eye on God. And then he makes this better than comment. It's better to be rebuked, to be chastised, to be criticized by a man who has wisdom and to be flattered from a fool. And there's this idea that flattery will get you anything you want. Solomon says, flattery, all it is, is a bunch of fluff. It's a bunch of building you up with no foundation. And when you fall, you're going to fall hard. It's better, it's, better that, that it's better to be rebuked. It's better to be corrected from someone who has experience. Because that person that is wise is going to tell you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. This is why it's so important for uh, presidents, kings, for people uh, of authority and power to surround themselves with advisors that aren't afraid to speak up, with advisors that aren't afraid to tell that person, that king, that president, when they're wrong. Uh, President Reagan um, had some people in his cabinet whose job it was to come up with a criticism to, to tell him why his plan wouldn't work. And they weren't afraid to be fired. 
And I think this, and, and President Lincoln had the same attitude. And, and, and I think this is what Solomon is saying. You need to, to take the, 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 the rebuke, listen to the advice from those who are wise, and to be hanging around a bunch of people that are going to tell you what you want to hear, because it, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help you. And, and he, he, calls, he calls flattery thorn bushes. Uh, just uh, Saturday, uh, we, we had a little cookout outside. The girls wanted some grilled hot dogs. And I didn't have any, any coal to burn, but I did have some, uh, some uh, firewood. And uh, I sent the girls to get me some leaves, some dry leaves, and I put those dry leaves underneath that firewood, and, and we, we turned that flame on, and, and those leaves, they burned quickly. I mean, with, within seconds, they were gone. That's what thorn bushes do. They're used as kindling. And, and you, you light thorns on fire, and, and they burn hot, but that heat doesn't last. Same thing with flattery. Flattery will make you feel good, will uh, massage your ego, but that's all it's going to do. It's not going to give you any substance. It's not going to give you any direction. And, and, and that's why uh, Solomon is, is saying to us, in essence, listen to what your parents tell you, because your parents have been there and they've done that. They've lived that life. Listen to the instruction of your teacher. If your doctor tells you to, to get on a diet and exercise more, he's telling you this for a reason. He knows more than you. One, one of the uh, doctors that I would visit in Indiana, he had a plaque on his wall that said, my, my uh, doctorates, my medical uh, degree from IU, Indiana University, is worth more than your research on Google. Uh, because nowadays with computers, everyone's become an expert on everything. But don't, don't listen to Google for medical advice. Listen to your doctors. And uh, when you're on a team, the coach is there for a reason, and he's called a coach for a reason. Not just to be a cheerleader, but to help you make adjustments during the game, to, to help you uh, see things from a different perspective so that you can win the game. And this is what Solomon is saying. The wise will, will give you advice to win the game. The wise would give you advice that you can do something with. The comedian, he's just going to make you laugh, but it'll be a thorn bush that just burns quickly. In verse 7, he makes this point as, as if it was in passing, you know. He says, oh, and by the way, the wise can also become fools. Uh, the, the, those with integrity can lose their integrity. Uh, th those that um, represent the law can become criminals. Those that are wise, like Solomon, can become idiots, like Solomon. And I think Solomon, when he gives us all this advice in the seventh chapter, um, he's looking at his own picture, at his own life. He's looking, in, 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 he's looking at a mirror. Chapter 7 and verse 8, the first half of verse 8 says, um, you know, the destination is better than the beginning. Um, it, it's, it's better. Look, look at chapter 7 and verse, verse 8 so we can read it exactly. He says, the end of a matter is better than its beginning. Um, I, I often thought that uh, he was talking about an argument between a husband and a wife. And, and I guess it could be applied because... Uh, uh, it's better to end the argument. It's better when the argument's over and the calmness settles in. Uh, but really, I think more in line with what he's saying is that a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step, but that thousandth step, that last step that you take, it's, it's more delicious. It's better. It's, it's, it's celebrated more than the first step. So what's, what does all this mean? Someone who is 15 years old thinks he knows it all. Someone who's 70 knows he doesn't know it all. Wisdom comes with age. And to have the strength, the vitality of a teenager with the wisdom of a 70-year-old, boy, wouldn't that be great? But that's not the way it works. And this is what Solomon is saying, that, that the end of a matter is better than the beginning of the matter. Uh, age come or with wisdom or age wisdom comes with age the second part of verse eight 
chapter seven, verse eight. Second part says patience of spirit is better than haughtiness of spirit or, or patience is better than, than pride. Um, I, I, would, I would assume that uh, Solomon is talking about don't waste your time uh, living in the past. Don't waste your time thinking about the good old days. You know, look at verse um, uh, verse 10. Do not say, why is it that the former days were better than, than these? Uh, keep your eye on the prize. Always go forward. Always go, go, go towards heaven. Don't turn back. This should remind us of um, Lot's wife. Uh, here's a bit of trivia. Do you remember what Lot's wife's name was? Look it up. You'll never, uh, her name was Mrs. Lot. That, I guess that's the joke. Uh, but anyway, Solomon's advice is live in the moment, enjoy the opportunities of today, and don't be thinking about the good old days. Uh, about 20 years ago, I was teaching a class in Indiana, and um, one of the younger members of the church uh, was talking about how he would love to live during the simpler days, how he would love to live during the horse and buggy days. Oh, how life was a lot simpler then. And then a sister who was in her 90s said, well, you can keep your good old days. Let me tell you about those good old days. I had to get up early in the morning to go cut firewood so that we could cook on a, on a firewood stove, on a wood stove. I had to go and draw water from the well. I had to go outside in the middle of the night, in the middle of the winter, to use a potty. Uh, whenever someone in the family died, it took months for a letter to get to us. Now you can keep your good old days. I like my modern days. I like my telephone. I like my uh, the, the US Postal Service. I like the car. I like the running water and inside plumbing. Uh, why, why waste our time thinking about how good we had it in the past when we'll never be able to go to the past? We're only going to go to the future. So think about today. Live today. Make today the best day of your life. And I know that's an old cliche, but that's what Solomon is saying. Because in the past, you won't gain anything but in the future, you'll gain everything if your eye is on the prize. So then in the next section of the seventh chapter, he gives us oh, five or six, maybe seven things that wisdom uh, gives us, that wisdom provides. First of all, in verses 11 through 12, wisdom provides us protection. It, 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 protects, it protects us, wisdom protects us from, um, from the pitfalls of life. How many times have we heard about, you know, a, uh, an athlete from Auburn or Alabama that, that has a lot of potential and, and they're looking to get signed up by the NFL? I mean, that is their, their big dream. Make it big in the NFL. And they get that big multi-million dollar contract. And they didn't invest one cent they partied it up. They, they wasted it away on, on uh, drugs and, and girls and parties and whatever else. And then they got hurt and it ended their career. Wisdom teaches us to not do things like that. Wisdom teaches us to not live life that way. As a matter of fact, wisdom teaches us, if you remember the parable of the talents, invest your money at least, put it in the bank so you can get some interest on it. Be wise in, in how you use the blessings that God has given us. Wisdom not only provides protection from our own selves, but it provides a good, broad perspective uh, on, on life. And again, this is going back to um, to living in the old or, or the good old days uh, and, and, and not understanding uh, or at least not giving up control to God. Look at verse 11. Wisdom along with an inheritance is good and an advantage to those 
who see the sun. God, God is in control. Uh, that's what verses 13 and 14 are teaching us. Consider the work of God for who is able to straighten what he has bent. In the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider that God has made both, both the good days and the bad days. Uh, wisdom teaches us that there's some things that I just cannot change. Wisdom teaches me that I can't control how other people think or how they behave. Wisdom teaches me that I can't stop the tornado from happening. Remember the serenity prayer? One of those, uh, one of those lines of that serenity prayer is, it says that give me the wisdom to, to know the difference between what I can and cannot change. You know, I, I guess what Solomon is getting at is that instead of being angry and bitter when things go bad, learn the lessons from that bad experience and use that to your advantage. What, what can I do in the future to avoid whatever happened? Or what can I do today so that in the future I can handle that situation better? Because who can change what God has bent is what he's asking. Nobody can. In Job 2 and verse 10, the patriarch says to his wife, uh, who had said to, to Job, you're sick, you stink, and, and your children are dead, your property's gone, and you still maintain integrity, you still are righteous. Why won't you just curse God and die? And Solomon says, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? You know, we're happy with God when everything's going great, but upset with God when things aren't going right. Wisdom provides us with perspective. What you can change, change what you can't accept. What you can't change, accept. It also provides us with balance. In verses 15 through, through 18, I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. There is a righteous man who perishes in the righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. You know, so Solomon is, is saying, look, at one time I used to get upset. Get upset at the idea that here is this, this poor fellow who, who only has you know, a small little little hut and, and, and one little lamb. He has a wife and one child and he doesn't have much, but he loves his neighbor. He treats everybody with respect. And then he gets stricken with some disease and dies. Then there's this unrighteous man who, who man, through, through bad, de I mean, through uh, uh, dishonesty, he, he's become wealthy. He has mistreated the poor and he's become wealthy. He is so unrighteous, but yet he's wealthy. He's so unrighteous and lives to be a hundred. He, he, Solomon says, I used to think that wasn't fair. That wasn't right. But now I accept that what you need to worry about is how you live your life. Uh, verse Verse 16, don't be too righteous and don't be too wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Don't be excessively wicked with what, uh, rather, don't be excessively wicked and don't be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you grasp one thing and also not let go of the other, for the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. So his advice is live godly. Draw closer to God. Don't lose touch with humanity. Don't forget who your neighbor is. Accept what reality is. That's what he's saying in those verses. Wisdom provides strength. In verses 19 through 22, he says, Wisdom strengthens a wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and never sins. Also, don't take seriously all the words which are spoken. Uh, and, and I think the other translation says, don't, don't be listening on other people's conversation because you might hear them say something that is going to hurt your feelings. And by the way, remember that you also have said some foolish things about other people. Uh, I, I think that the wisdom that Solomon is talking about here is that wisdom to understand that there is not a perfect man in this world. 
As Paul says in Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the word fall there is present progressive. In other words, I'm going to sin today and I'm going to, I've sinned today and I'm going to sin tomorrow. There is nothing that I can do in this life to make me think that I'm worthy of God's grace. Accept that fact. And again, don't be too thin-skinned that everything that, that's negative, uh, that's said about you, that's going to hurt your feelings. In other words, learn, learn how to laugh, learn how to take a joke. And furthermore, don't believe everything you hear. And I can tell you that about our news media. And I don't care which channel you tune into. It could be CNN, MSNBC, Fox, or whatever. They don't all tell us the whole truth. So here's Solomon's advice. Ignore some things that are spoken. And many times we say things without thinking things through ourselves. So give, give, a little, give some people some slack. And finally, this is what wisdom provides. Insight. Verse 23. Verse 23 says, For you, uh, I tested all this with wisdom and I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. What has been is remote and exceedingly mysterious. Who can discover it? I, I directed my mind to know, to investigate, to seek wisdom and, and an explanation and to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. And, and then I discovered that it, it's useless. I, I discovered that, that I, I don't know it all. I, I discovered that, I, I, well, he, he, he got some insight is what he's saying. So he says, first of all, Verse 23, you need to be wise enough to know that you don't know it all. You need to be wise enough to know that, that there is no way, doesn't matter how many books you read, doesn't matter what school you, attern, uh, you attend, you will never know it all. Now, there are some folks that think that they know it all. There are some folks that think that, that, that well, they just know it all. And he says, you don't. And Solomon says, everything that I've told you in the seventh chapter, I tested it. I tested it with wisdom. And I found out that I myself, even with that divine measure of wisdom from God, I, I still didn't know it all. And then in verses 24 and 28 through 28, he says this. Being a playboy doesn't bring you true happiness. Having a wife and two or three women on the side doesn't bring you happiness. It's just a mirage. Those bright Las Vegas lights that whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Not if you get some type of venereal disease, it goes with you. It says it's just a mirage. The, the pleasures of the flesh are just passing. And it promises you, money promises you uh, happiness. Drugs promise you happiness. Alcohol promises you happiness. But it's just going to bring destruction. If not in this lifetime, it will in the one to come. There's a lady that uh, was a friend of my grandmother. And uh, she had uh, shoplifted. And that was what she did. She shoplifted a lot. And about the fifth or sixth time that she had gone before the judge, the judge finally said, I'm going to put you in jail for six months so you can learn your lesson. And then she said, why is God so mean to me? Solomon says in verse 29, when you get into trouble, don't blame God. When you get into trouble, don't say it's God's fault. It's man's fault. Man's fault. Behold, I, found, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. And I want you to think about this. God has made man righteous or upright. Let's go way back to the Garden of Eden. Whose fault was it that Adam and Eve sinned? Well, Eve said it was the serpent's fault. 
Adam says it was Eve's, uh, Eve's fault. But notice, notice, notice who actually they're blaming. Adam said, it is the woman that you gave me. In other words, had you not given me this woman, I would not have sinned. But that's not true. It's not God's fault. The reason man sins, the reason why many of us find ourselves in, in, in financial trouble or marital problems, it's not God's fault. But it's because man has sought out many devices. We've done many things that we should not have done. We've done many things that have made our lives difficult. So Solomon says, have the wisdom to understand that. Ha have the wisdom to accept that reality. Have the wisdom to have the insight that it's not God's fault, but it's man's desire to do it his way that has made him suffer. So this is why I believe the seventh chapter of Ecclesiastes is that Solomon's prodigal journey back home. Because Solomon chapters one through six Boy, he, he, he describes his life as a rebel, as a renegade, as a playboy. Chapter 7 through the end of the book, he describes his life as, I'm sorry I lived that way. But you know what? I can't live in the past. I can live in the present and make sure that I'm living in a, in a way that God's going to be pleased with me. So then in the day of judgment, he can say, well done, good and faithful, sir. God bless.